Good morning, would you please stand with us as we start off by singing? Welcome to Venture. My name is Caleb, I'm the worship pastor. This is Allison and Brittany, we're your worship leaders here today. We're so honored to get to be here and singing with you this morning. We just sang a, a song talking about how we can give our fears to God through praise. And I wanna read from Matthew 11. If you came to the worship night, uh, we actually shared this verse too. It's just been on my heart a lot recently. Matthew 11, verse 28 says, "'Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, "'and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find a rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
The next song that we're gonna sing just talks about um, when we fight, we fight on our knees with our hands lifted high and we lay our fears at his feet. Last night I was hanging out with uh, my kids, our youngest, her name, we call her Ray. She's about a year old and she dropped something really heavy off the, shelf, off the shelf and made a super loud noise, scared her and she came running straight towards me with her hands up in the air. And, and I just kind of had this image in my head as we sing this song of what that looks like for us as the sons and daughters of our father to go running when we have fear, worry, anxieties, whatever that is, with our hands lifted high and saying, Lord, would you just fight this for me? I'm really afraid right now. So I don't know what you walk in here today with, whether you're carrying fear or a burden, or maybe you're carrying joy, maybe you're holding on to something that um, you've had a hard time letting go of. Can we just join together with our hands lifted high and say, when we fight, the battle belongs to you, Lord. Let's join together.
we find ourselves chasing a lot of things in life. Whether it be success, uh, perceived happiness, uh, mental peace, belonging, freedom, And Lord, some of those things aren't, aren't bad things. But anything that we put in front of you is an idol. And so this morning, Lord, with a posture of open hands, or we just pray individually as followers of you and, and collectively as Venture Christian Church in, in Carmel, Indiana, Lord, that... Um, Lord, here is where we lay it down, and you are the only thing that we're chasing. Lord, tomorrow when we uh, are blessed with another day to, to wake up and take a breath, and reminded by um, the sunrise and by your nature of your goodness and of your faithfulness once again, um, Lord, would we choose to chase after you and you alone and set all of the other things aside. Because you are where we will find true freedom, true belonging, true satisfaction, true joy. Jesus, that we would make room for you. And it's in your name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks so much for singing. You can go and have a seat. Just want to welcome everyone again. For those of you who are in the room and those online, we're so happy that you've joined us today. My name is Jenny White, and here at Venture, we first and foremost want to seek Jesus, but we also want to see you and get to know you. And one of the ways that you can help us to do that is through filling out our Connect card. So you'll see a QR code up on the screen. Um, feel free to pull out your phones and fill out the Connect card. Let us know that you're here worshiping with us today. You'll also see an area where you can put a praise or um, share a prayer request as well. And our um, church staff, they pray over those prayer requests every Wednesday. So they will be heard and um, your prayers will be lifted up. If you are new to Venture, maybe a first-time guest, I just want to say welcome again to you and an extended invitation to you. Um, so my friend Amy is going to be out at what we call starting point after service today, and that's right by the welcome desk. We have a gift that we would love to give you and just meet you, get to know you, um, answer any questions that you have about Venture. Also, if you are newer to Venture, um, maybe you're even online and have been joining us online but haven't been here in person yet, I do want to invite you next Sunday is the second Sunday of March, and that is our meet and greet Sunday. So after each service, um, we have a really casual time where you can meet the Venture staff and their families and our elders, and so I'd love to invite you to stop by after the services next week, and that will be in our children's wing down by the mountain. So you, won't, you can't miss it. It's a, a really big playground area. So I'd love to invite you to that next week. And, you know, at Venture, we are a very generous church. And, you know, thank you for all of the giving through our New Life series. Um, if you have a gift that you have brought today, you can put that in the boxes on the way out. And you can also give online at venturechristian.church slash give. So again, thank you for the ministries that you are fueling, not only here in Hamilton County and here at Venture, but around the globe as well. Um, you are helping people to learn about the love of Jesus, which is incredible. 
You know, I do want to mention, and um, this is for the ladies, that we have a women's event that is coming up called If Venture. And today is the last day to register to guarantee your shirt size. So I will say, the last two years, the shirts were really amazing, and we get a lot of compliments on them. So you don't want to miss that opportunity. Um, so yes, you want to come to the conference for sure. It's a wonderful event. Um, but make sure you register by today so you get your t-shirt as well. So we are getting ready to um, have Pastor Stan come up to continue our series in Philippians. But before we do that, can I just invite everyone to stand up one more time? Let's just welcome each other. Uh, maybe introduce yourself to someone you haven't met before, and um, then we'll get started. All right, party people, go ahead and make your way back to your seat. And while you do, if you haven't done so already, grab your Bible, if you would, or maybe you follow along in the Venture app, or you've got a Bible app. Open up to Philippians chapter 3. We're looking at verse 1 today. We're continuing in this journey through Philippians. We are chasing joy. Before we do that, though... Uh, I want to kind of just make sure we're all tracking on church calendar kind of stuff. I don't want you to miss out on any opportunity. There's some cool stuff that's getting ready to happen right around the corner here at Venture. Here you go. This week and next week, we are going to wrap up part one of this Chasing Joy Philippians series. The following Sunday, you don't want to miss, um, well, I say part one because we're going to come back to Philippians after Easter. We're going to take a break to celebrate real joy, uh, but we'll be coming back to this after Philippians, after Easter, March 17th. Don't miss that Sunday, two weeks from now. A buddy of mine named Dave Hootke is going to be here preaching, and he has just written a book called Walking Through the Valleys. The only way out is through. Somebody here today resonates with this message from the back of the book. Unmet expectations, discouragement, suffering, grief, hurt. These are some of the topics. Think 23rd Psalm. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we're not meant to set up camp there. We're supposed to walk through it. If I'm talking to you right now, I actually have. You can't wait maybe for two weeks for that message. I've got a free copy of the book I'd love to give you today. If I just describe something you'd like to process, meet me out in the lobby afterwards, and I've got a copy of that book for you. For everybody else, uh, they will have his books here that week. So that's March 17th. Okay, then we're going to do a three-week series for Easter. Think the week before, that's Palm Sunday, Easter itself, and the week after. I've got a graphic here to put up. Easter adventure, experience the light of Jesus in the midst of darkness. Is that reminiscent of an eclipse? I hope you're catching that. We're going to lean into that a little bit through that series. And then after it's done, we're going to wrap it up April 7th. April 8th, I don't know if you've heard or not, there's a big eclipse event happening here, and Hamilton County is kind of like an epicenter of that. It's going to be hard to drive anywhere that day in Hamilton County, as I understand it. Kids are out of school. Make your plans now to join us here. We're going to have like a block party out here on the back lawn. Live music. The Flying Toasters will be performing. 20 bucks a car load. You could fill your van like a clown car with all kinds of folks. 20 bucks will get you a parking spot. Why are we charging for parking? Well, because we're offsetting the cost of the event so that neighbors can come for free. So if you, especially if you live within walking distance of the property, plan to walk that day and bring neighbors and friends, whoever lives near you, along with you. Uh, and in the meantime, be investing and inviting. And you can sign up for that online uh, adventure. There's some cool stuff happening right around the corner. Okay, we're in Philippians chapter 3. As we go there, I need to just let you know, this message today uh, comes with a PG warning. be a perfect time to remind you that we've got an incredible kids ministry right down the hall. 
I'm talking PG. You know, I grew up in the 80s. PG meant something different then than it does today. But I want to share with you that there's a bit. Paul is speaking. I, I think there's a line you can get right up to. I don't think he crosses the line, but I think he gets right up to it. You'll understand here in just a minute. He might have actually been giving himself a little bit of self-talk when he wrote the letter to the Ephesians, not Philippians, but the church in Ephesus. Look at this. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4, he says, Nor should there be any obscenity. There's nothing obscene in this letter to the Philippians. I want to set your mind at ease. Nothing obscene. Foolish talk. It's not foolish talk, actually. Today, we're leaning back. We're going back. This is kind of a refresher course from last summer. Perhaps you remember the series we did, Recovering Pharisees Like Me. I shared autobiographically during that series. I wrestle with that, and I bet if you grew up in the church, you do as well. There's nothing foolish about this message. Truth be told, there's a lot of wisdom here that we should grab a hold of, so that doesn't apply, but coarse joking. Like I said, I think Paul in this letter to the Philippians gets right up to the line. He doesn't cross it, but I bet there was a little bit of smirking, a little bit of giggling going back and forth, especially between the dudes when they heard this letter read out aloud in the assembly of the saints. I think it's also possible that when Paul was pinning the words here to the Philippians, Epaphrodites, you heard about him last week. I bet there was a moment, even as he was writing this letter in his own hand, I bet they shared a smile. I bet Paul might have been, oh, writing with a smirk on his face. You'll understand why here in a minute. These are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. There's two words that we're going to hear. Circumcision. This would not have been out of place in the first century, certainly among Jewish people. Actually, it would have been very much known of in the marketplace and in the marketplace of ideas. If you were a young parent or if you had friends that were young parents, good golly, you would have gone and seen this on public display day eight of a child's life. You would have known all about circumcision. You would have witnessed it happening. There's another word he uses here, though, and it's the word mutilation. I think that's when there might have been a little bit of smirking, a little bit of grinning going on. Paul would say, or rather a linguist might say, that Paul is being just a little bit cheeky with the language here, a little bit tongue-in-cheek. The title of the message is... Um, Windows and mirrors. We're going to look at this metaphor a little bit. Don't get caught navel gazing. Don't get caught falling in love with your own reflection. If you, like me, are like Paul, are a recovering Pharisee, sometimes we can get a little bit captured by the image in the mirror. Rather, shatter the mirror, rather look through a window. Jesus is on the other side of that window. He's calling to you. Better yet, don't get in the way of somebody else who's looking through that window and looking toward Jesus. You're blocking the view. Mirrors and windows. If I were to subtitle this message, I would call it looking good because I don't know about you, but through a lens of Christian or religiosity achievement, sometimes, sometimes we can get too captured with this idea. Paul cautions against that. Actually, I think it's a strong caution. Here's the big idea, especially type A's. Listen to this. We can only be content. I might even encourage you to replace that word content with, we can only really chase joy when we have Jesus written all over our resume. The resume that you're writing for God, those bullet points that you're so proud of. I did the right things. I said the right things. I didn't say the wrong things. What I'm doing, God, aren't you proud of me? Oh, boy. You have to be so careful of your motives here. Okay, let's dive into the text. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 starts with, finally, my brothers. By the way, I love 
Paul's heart here. In true preacher fashion, he uses the word finally, and then he writes the whole second half of the letter, right? We're just halfway through, and he's using the word finally. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. Safe? That's kind of a strange word to use there. He's the one in prison. He's the one writing to them. Why is he concerned about their safety? My opinion, he's not talking about their physical safety at this point. I think he's talking about spiritual safety. When you spend too much time gazing at your own reflection in the mirror, your own works of righteousness, you can miss out on the good things that God has in store for you. You're called to be a window. Not look at the mirror. Safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Oh, boy. Have you ever been to Tijuana? Have you ever been to one of those spaces where there's mongrel, skinny, scrawny dogs looking for scraps everywhere you go? And they just, they're they're annoying. You turn around and there they are. Paul's not talking about Fido or Fluffy. He's talking about those kind of dogs. Just annoying. Look out for the dogs. But you know what? He's not actually talking about dogs. He's talking about people. And he's calling them dogs. Can you feel his blood pressure rising just a little bit, even as he's writing this letter? Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. They're not just annoying. These people, what they're doing is downright evil. Watch out for them. Look out for those who, here he uses the word, mutilate the flesh. When he uses this word, I think, especially the dudes in the congregation, there was some eye contact that happened in that moment. Probably eye contact that was held until a wife or a mother elbowed them in the ribs and said, knock it off, you're embarrassing us. I bet when Paul wrote this, he and Epaphroditus shared a smile. This is meant to be a little bit tongue-in-cheek. He's making a point here. Let's keep reading. For we are the circumcision. He uses that word. That's when that eye contact, oh, that's exactly what he's talking about. We know what he's upset about. We know the stories of what has been happening. He's talking about circumcision, but wait, there's more. We are the circumcision, he says. Interesting. Who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence. Here he uses the word flesh. Flesh. Mutilation, circumcision. Is he talking about? Yeah, this is what he's talking about. Now, I want you to notice this. This dash right here. Paul goes on an epic rant. For several verses, he's just ranting. We're going to study that here in a little bit. We're going to read those together here in a little bit. But right now, I just want to skip those verses. Pay attention to the dash. Put no confidence in the flesh. Rant, 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 rant. Hit the next slide. He keeps ranting. He's still ranting. Hit the next slide. Here he goes. He's on an epic rant, still ranting. Okay, hit the next slide. He's still on a rant all the way down here. This dash, linguistically, tie this back to the beginning. Have no confidence in the flesh. Your righteousness should depend on God. That comes from faith. That I may know him. My confidence is not in the mirror. My confidence is what's on the other side of the window. Who's him? Jesus. Know him. And the power of Jesus' resurrection. And that I may share in his sufferings here in a few verses. He's going to talk about running a race and keeping his eyes on the goal that Jesus is calling him toward to finish well. Becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. What I'm aiming for here is not what I see in the mirror, but what's through the window. It's eternity with Jesus. Let me not get distracted by this. The rant in the middle of that, this is what we need to dial in on. This is what we need to focus in on here. Here, Here's the challenge. Don't let your spiritual resume get in the way of Jesus. Those things that you do, even when you're doing them for, for God, those gold stars that you stacked up in Sunday school when you were a little kid, were you really doing those for Jesus Or were you doing that for your own achievement, your own attaboy? 
Oh, look at you. Aren't you a great little boy, little girl, doing the right things, saying the right things? Be careful. Your resume, ah, it's temporary. You're already loved by God. There's nothing you can do to make Him love you more. If you're chasing after those things and you're puffing yourself up and you're wanting people to look at you, what you're wearing, how you're dressed, how you're acting, how you do worship, how you do life in Christian community, if that's you, if you're, if you're taking it one step further and saying, it's not just Jesus, but it's Jesus and the way you worship. Jesus and the way you live your life through a system and a series of rules and regulations that are fairly subjective by your own rules that you're setting. Paul would have a word for you. He would call you a Judaizer. Uh, worse, he might call you a Pharisee. This is a part of his epic rant. Because you need to understand what's been going on here. For a while now, when he writes this letter to the Philippians, he would go into a city like Philippi, or he'd go into a city like Corinth or Ephesus. He would preach the gospel. He would say, follow Jesus. People would reply and say, yes, we're all in. We want to follow Jesus. These are Greek-thinking people, people who are not familiar with Jewish customs. And then uh, he would leave town, and the Judaizers, these dogs, these evildoers, these mutilators of the flesh would show up, and they would say, oh, that's not good enough. It's Jesus and. It's cute that you're following Jesus, but have you been circumcised yet? These Greek people would be, have I been? What? Wait, you want me to do what? This is why they're smirking when the letter got read out loud. This has been going on for a while now. You could go back even to the early parts of the story in Acts chapter 15. Actually, I'd encourage you to go there. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. This is what's going on. The gospel has literally exploded. People are getting on ships, people like Paul, people like Barnabas, Ships and camel caravans and however you get all over those Roman roads in the first century, they would show up in a location, they would preach the gospel, and then these dogs, these mutilators of the flesh, these Judaizers would show up behind him. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, brothers and sisters in Jesus Greek people just made a decision to follow Jesus. Unless you're circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, here's a flint knife, we can make this happen right now, you cannot be saved. It's freaking people out. And it made Paul angry. Let's read. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate. That's a polite way of saying he put up his dukes and he said, we have to fight this out right now. By the way, if you like the Super Bowl, you should thank God for Acts chapter 15, that first Jerusalem council. Without this argument being settled once and for all, the Super Bowl would be in serious debate because you can't touch a pigskin. I'm smoking some pork butts at my house right now for a welcome to venture meal tonight for new folks, connection folks. And uh, listen, uh, you, well, we'd have to change the menu if it weren't, uh, you know, Acts chapter 15 hadn't happened. Worse yet you would not know the taste of bacon. You couldn't be a Jesus follower and eat bacon had it not happened here. It duped it out, fought it out in Acts chapter 15. Praise God. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Let's settle this argument. Is Jesus enough, or does it have to be Jesus and? This got settled a long time ago. They won the argument. They won the fight. It's not Jesus and. Jesus is enough. You can read the story in Acts 15 for yourself. Here we are several years later. Paul's writing to the Philippians and these Judaizers. They're still fighting this tired, old argument. He uses two words, just in case you're curious. Catatome. This is the word that I think they smirked at. It's mutilation. He's literally coming right up to the line and he's making a point. You guys, this is absurd. The other word that you find here is the word for circumcision, paratome. And he's saying that, listen, if you're a Jesus follower, 
you need, a circum, you need to circumcise your heart. He says that elsewhere. True circumcision is this, that you worship God in the Spirit. We're going to talk about that next week. That you are a window. You're going to rejoice in Jesus and him alone. That people are going to be able to look through you and see Jesus in all his glory standing behind you. And that you're not going to be a mirror. Where you look in that mirror and you smile at what you see. He puts it this way, have no confidence in the flesh. So this message today has two action steps. They're very closely related. The first one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Reject the mirror. Reject the mirror. It has such an allure. If you grew up in the church, you know what this is. Look at me. Aren't I doing well? I'm doing the right things. I'm not doing the wrong things. Paul puts it this way. Have no confidence in the flesh. By the way, if anybody could fall in love with his own reflection, it would have been Paul. He definitely was one of those guys that was voted most likely to succeed. You can see that underneath the text all through the New Testament. The guy was an overachiever in big ways. He definitely would have been somebody in our context leading a Fortune 500 company. This dude studied under Gamaliel. He was the best of the best. And he goes on this rant, I alluded to it earlier, but he kind of like just leaks his resume, and you start to think, oh gosh, Paul, are you bragging? What's going on here? But then he makes a profound point in the middle of it. Let's read it together. I'm in verse 4. I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. Also. Those Judaizers, those evildoers, those dogs, those mutilators of the flesh that come behind me and say it's Jesus and, listen, I know what they're thinking, but Jesus has redeemed me. I used to be just like them. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I'm a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, listen, I am blameless. There's so much going on here. We just need to unpack these phrases. Because Paul could have boasted. If he was going to do navel gazing, if he was just going to look in the mirror his whole life, he could have boasted in things of a racial or national nature. He had a lot of pride in who he was and where he came from, and for good reason. He was circumcised on the eighth day. This means he was not a proselyte. He did not come to faith later in life, but he was born into this thing. Listen, I go way back, all the way to my day eight of life. They circumcised me. There were a lot of witnesses there that saw that. It was a public display. I go way back of the stock of Israel. I come from Israel. You might know him as Jacob. He's he's saying, listen, I'm directly descended from Jacob. This is pretty important through a nationalistic first century lens because the Arabs could boast of their descent from Abraham. The Edomites could boast of their descent from Isaac, but only the Jews could boast of Jacob and their descent from him. And Paul is saying that. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. Listen, this is the son of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel. He's saying, I'm not just uh, circumcised on the eighth day. I don't just go way back. I'm not just from the stock of Israel, but I'm the best of the best. Twelve, thirteen tribes, if you count the two half-tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. If you count them, listen, I'm from the best of the best, the tribe of Benjamin, Jacob's first or beloved wife, Rachel. The son of that union is Benjamin. The only son that actually was born in the promised land was Benjamin. Israel's first king, Saul, was born from this tribe. And the only tribe that remained true to Judah when the kingdom was divided was the tribe of Benjamin. He's saying, I'm a Hebrew of a Hebrew. Both of my parents were Jewish people. He could also talk about religious stuff. Actually, As a Pharisee, he would have taken great pride that he was seeking to follow all 613.
13 of the laws found in the Old Testament, the Mosaic Code. If you'd like to see this list of laws, pull out your phone right now. I've got a QR code. You can just aim your phone at that. Click the link, and it'll bring up a page that will show you all 613 of those laws. And some of them, you're like, yeah, I could do that. Some of them, like bacon, I'm not going to do that. Paul, Paul was strictly adhering to all 613 of those laws. So he could have boasted in things not just of a racial or national nature, but of a religious nature as well. He says, concerning the law, I'm a Pharisee. You want to talk legalism, listen, I was the best of the best. He says, concerning zeal, I was persecuting the church. By the way, everything this man did, he did with zeal, with enthusiasm for his religion. Look at Acts chapter 23, verse 1. He looks straight at the Sanhedrin. This is the ruling body, the national ruling body of the Jewish people. And he says, my brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. I've been following God as a Pharisee. And then once he knocked me on my can on that road to Damascus, and I saw a different way of doing it, now I'm following Jesus with the same zeal. And then he tells this story in Acts chapter 26. He talks about how wrong he was before Jesus knocked him back. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests. Listen, you guys sent me out. I studied under Gamaliel. I'm the best of the best. I put many of the saints in prison. What else? When they were put to death? I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme in my obsession. That's a big word against them. I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. He had zeal. He says, concerning the righteousness which is the law, I was blameless. In other words, all 613 of those laws, I held to them. He wasn't perfect, but he was diligent. Of all those things, though, Paul says this. Don't miss this. Paul considered these things lost for Jesus. He set his resume aside so that he could look through the window and chase hard after God. Verse 7, he says this, Whatever I had as gain, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. That whole resume, let me set it aside. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's the boss of my life. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things. And count them, here's a big word, as rubbish, garbage. They belong to the dung heap in order that I may gain Christ. He had lost quite a bit, by the way. There are a lot of things that he had set aside for Jesus. He writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11. Check this out. To this very hour we go hungry, thirsty. He's in rags. He's given up even his wardrobe. Brutally treated, homeless. Look at all this. We work hard. We're cursed. We're persecuted. The next slide says that we're slandered. People are talking all kinds of things about us that aren't even true. Went from being the Pharisee that studied under Gamaliel to people are calling me the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. I consider all those things as loss for the sake of knowing Jesus. Here's my question. How are you building your resume? What about you? What are you proud of when you stare in that mirror? Are there some things that you would stack up and say, look at me, God, look what I'm doing. Look at, my, at me, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Aren't I doing well? I'm doing the right things. I'm not doing the wrong things. Aren't you proud of me? What are you taking pride in? I've told you a few times now, Dawn and I have a new to how a new new to us house, and we're working to remodel it. We're putting in some sweat equity. Some of you have been helping with that. We, we've also been hiring some different subcontractors in, including this last week. We had a crew, incredible dudes, four Hispanic guys. Just I, it's amazing to me what they got accomplished in a short amount of time. 
Yesterday, I had a conversation with their, their, their leader, the boss, and uh, was making payment for the job that they had just done. And we started talking about, I asked him, where are you guys from? I recognize, I mean, language was an issue. We had a language barrier with us. And he said, Mexico. We start talking, and I couldn't help but think, how many times does my national identity, Paul talks about things that he put on the garbage heap, the rubbish heap, how many times does my national identity get in the way of my Jesus identity? Oh, be so careful, church, especially in a year like this year, an election year, don't let your national identity Get in the way of Jesus. That's a mirror, not a window. I had a conversation with another one of the guys that had been serving in our house and working in our house. When we started this project, Dawn had a huge heart for this. She said, hey, listen, let's hire subcontractors that maybe we don't know where they are with their Jesus walk. She was thinking through the lens of, you know, a couple years ago we said, we, you have one life to invest. Who's the one life you're investing in? I get stuck inside of a Christian bubble. I spend all of my time with people like you. Not that that's a bad thing, but the opportunity to connect with people who may be living far from God, this is an opportunity for us. Let's seize the day. By the way, be praying this week. One of those guys texted me, and he's got some questions about Jesus. We're going to have lunch this week. I can't wait to sit down with he and another one of his employees, his workers, and we're going to have lunch together. And he's bringing the questions. He's asked for this. I can't wait. What an opportunity to sit down together and talk about Jesus. Would you be praying for that? In the middle of this conversation, I love this text. He said, um, I'm learning to be humble instead of an ungrateful blank hole. Except he didn't say blank. It's right there in black and white, or actually green and white in my text. It's not blue and white, so clearly the dude doesn't have an iPhone. It's amazing the things we take pride in sometimes, isn't it? Those things that we elevate and we look in the mirror and say, oh, come on. Some of you, you hear me say that, and you react just like I did when I saw that text. And come on, I grew up in the locker room having conversations. I grew up working on a farm. That word is not alien and foreign to me. I hear that all the time. I watch the same movies and the same TV shows that you watch. But there was something about in the context of a Jesus conversation, I saw that word and I, I reacted. I went on a roller coaster in my own heart. I went, oh, no, we don't use that kind of language. You know what? That is the beautiful beginning of the sinner's prayer, isn't it? I mean, if you stop and think about that, somebody who's not walking with Jesus, I think Jesus reads that and he smiles. Oh, there's opportunity here. That's the beginning of a repentant heart. But did you react to it like I react to it? If so, maybe there's some room for movement in your heart just like there is mine. Remember I said two steps, two action steps. Number one, reject the mirror. Number two, open the window. Reject the mirror. Oh, look at me. I'm so proud of what I've accomplished. Look at my resume. Rather, open the window so that I can see Jesus. I can see the goal we're racing toward together. And I also can get out of the way so others can see people, see Jesus, rather, through me. Paul puts it this way. Rejoice in Christ Jesus. Joy. He's making it very clear. Joy is not found in temporary stuff like the things you see in the mirror looking back at you. It's found in Jesus. Are you chasing joy? He says in verse 8, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Paul would say, open the window to your soul and gain Christ. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having, let's put it on the screen, a righteousness of my own that, here, next slide, 
a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, not all 613 rules that I'm following impeccably, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, rant over, here's the point, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. He's going to go on here in a few verses and talk about running the race that God has called him to run. Make no mistake, the destination, the finish line is heaven. Everything that he says here is said through that lens. Like to be found in him. To be found in him means that I'm not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that is from God by faith, which means he's calling me to know him, in particular, to know the power of his resurrection. He preaches this all the time, any chance he gets. Ephesians chapter 1, he puts it this way, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, that you may know the hope, the inheritance, the the end of this race, heaven, that Jesus is calling you toward. This is a power that's first experienced in baptism. I love this. Whenever I do a baptism, I quote Colossians chapter 2, being buried with Christ in baptism and raised to a new life through faith in him. It's a power that's experienced through our lives. Ephesians chapter 3 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we could ask or even imagine. There's power there. Philippians chapter 3, he talks about ultimately our, our own bodily resurrection resurrection. This is what we're looking through the window toward. Our citizenship, he says, is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In order to do that, he says, I need to share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I like this quote from Charles Erdman. He says, such fellowship in the sufferings of Christ include a turning from sin And the death of self shatter the mirror. It may involve much hardship for the sake of Christ. For Paul, it finally meant martyrdom. He gave his life for Jesus. Turn from the mirror, shatter the mirror, turn instead to the window. And the goal for doing this, as as Paul put it, to attain the resurrection from the dead. Would you do me a favor right now? Would you reach over and grab those communion elements that were sitting on your seat when you came in? I want to spend some time giving you the opportunity to think through your resume, the bullet points that you're oh so proud of. Where are you putting your faith? Where are you putting your confidence? Let me ask you this question. Is your goal in life to, like Paul just said, to truly know Christ? Or are you chasing maybe your own achievement? Are you chasing your own reflection in the mirror that's looking back at you? Are you building up self or are you building up Jesus? As you're wrestling through that question, by the way, I'm going to give you some margin, some time to do that good and honest work with Jesus. There's a story that Paul would have been very familiar with because it would have been told hundreds of years before he was born. Those same Greek-thinking people that we're now hearing the news, it's Jesus and, it's Jesus and mutilation of the flesh. flesh. It's Jesus and circumcision. It's Jesus and what these Judaizers, these dogs are calling us to do. They would have been very familiar with this story as well because it's a Greek story. Perhaps you've heard of Narcissus. He falls in love with his own reflection, and it keeps him from living the life that, well, he's really called to live. He gets consumed by chasing his own reflection. Did you know that uh, the daffodils that are starting to poke up in your yard, if you have them like mine, those are also called the narcissists. And I think that they're there as a reminder every year I see that. I think, oh, how am I doing in that area? Am I chasing the temporal, the things of this earth, or am I chasing eternity? Don't get caught up in the mirror. You're called to be a window. Jesus is on the other side of that window, run toward him. And oh my goodness, don't get in the way 
of somebody who's trying to see Jesus, you're blocking the view. I'm going to invite you right now just to take a few minutes and ask Jesus how you're doing in this area. And when you're ready, you take the communion, and then we're going to respond in worship. Let me get us started. Jesus, we thank you for this moment right now. To pause, to reflect, to think about this past week and maybe even think about the week in front of us. Are we seeking to add bullet points to our resume? Are we seeking to make that reflection in the mirror looking back at us look better? Or are we seeking to draw people to you? We just need to get out of the way. Are we looking toward you, the deadline, the finish line, the thing we're racing toward, eternity with you? You're on the other side of that window. You're not the mirror looking back at us. So right now we pause and we reflect and we say we're sorry for the things we need to say we're sorry for. We ask for grace for the things that we repent of. We get out of the way. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you're ready, please stand and sing with us. If you'd like to remain seated and pray, feel free to do that as well.
Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. If um, something's starting in your heart or you need prayer for anything, Pastor Tony is going to be over here. We'd love to pray with you. If you're a guest with us today, we'd love for you to join us out at Starting Point. This is your reminder to do that and grab a free gift. And if you are a sixth through 12th grader or you have a 6th through 12th grader. Today is the last day you can sign up for everything happening this summer. So go see Jake Smith. He's the excited one back in the corner. Go talk to him. Sign up. We'll see you guys next week. Have a great week.